Hello, welcome to the podcast. Today we are welcoming a guest. We're el- welcoming Eric Wagner to the show. And you're a return guest, Eric. Thank you so much for being here today. You're very welcome. And it's nice to be a return guest. Yeah. And you pronounce my, well, pronounce my surname really well. Did I? Well, I, I, you know, I do my best. The, in, in Holland, we would say Wachter, but Wachter is, is a good English way or an American way to say it. Yeah. But I want to try the other way. Say that again. Wachter. 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 I won't be repeating that, no. but I did that once. It felt really strange in my, you know, that's, that was, <laughs> that was fun. So, um... Yeah, you know, back in episode 32, I mean, here we are in 80-something, and back in 32, you came and helped us so much with how to help children with challenging behaviors, and I've used it in my workshops. I've put your link in my um, webinars that I've done here as a school counselor because time and time again, parents are still coming to me, families come to me, and they want to know. What's the magic way that I can take care of my kids' behavior? And come to find out, you know, the patience and everything that you shared with us just rings so true to parents to say, hey, we can make a difference with our children. We can take a breath and use some approaches that will work. And I'm so excited to dive in to some different things with you because soon we're going to be sharing the stage at the Solution Focus Schools Unlimited Conference here in October 28th and 29th. You're going to be sharing with a group of school counselors all about how they can approach this in your life and the difference it's made for you. So I felt like it was only fitting that you came back on and shared with us a little bit how the Solution Focused Approach has really made a difference in your career and in your life. Okay. Um, when I knew that we we're going to talk about this topic, I had some fa- memories flashing by, and uh, it's it's mostly you know if I look back, I, I possibly work with over a thousand families using this approach. Uh, so I've seen many different kinds of families, and I thought, I mean. What could I share that might bring some light bulb moments for families? And so there are some solution focused principles, you know, part of my work, what I do is I train professionals to, you know, to, to help them to help families. But I thought if I share some of these solution focused principles that I use myself with my own family, I have a nine year old and I have a 19 year old. Um, and, and these principles work in daily life with your own family, but also with your friends, with your colleagues. Um, when I was first introduced to, the, to those principles, I, I often found myself talking to my friends problems, and I started uh, to use those solution focus principles. So I, I've got a few of them. So what I would suggest share is that I just bring one up, I talk about it, and maybe if you recognize it in your own experience and in your the work that you do at school or with families or your own family, that you you might have something to add there. Does that sound all right to you? Yeah? That sounds great. Let's go for it. So the first thing, and and it is really interesting because the things that I am going to share, in one way they make like very much common sense is logic, but often we don't do it. We don't see it. And and we, we continue to do what we are already doing. So the first thing that I wrote down on a piece of paper, is said, stop focusing on what you no longer want and start, start to focus on what it is that you do want. You know, as a family, when you are, let's say, experiencing some challenges within uh, with your children, and I can tell you I've been there plenty of times myself in my own family, you know, I don't remember if I shared it in episode 32, but my 19 year old, when he was two and a half, he was diagnosed with autism. So I had to really learn those principles. And and what I mean is by stop focusing on uh, what it is that we no longer want. I mean, as a parent, we can look at the situation and we can become maybe slightly irritated by the things that we no longer want and we can communicate to our children about, you know, stop fighting, for example. If you would say to your child, stop fighting, what the brain of the child actually hears is fight. (laughs) And so it it really is important if I no longer, and and how we turn 
let's say negative things around we use the word instead and so if your child if you no longer want your child to fight what is it that you would like your child to do instead and i think yeah, as a parent so before you go and start a communication with your child or with your partner um, it, it is asking yourself all right this is what is going on but what is it that i would like instead and once you can for format that give that like a detailed picture uh, it's, it will help you to understand where you want to take the journey on getting them there does that make sense a little bit that really does make a lot of sense because you're right whether it be in a meeting when we get together for a meeting the first thing that every individual wants to gravitate towards is the problem talk yeah. that we're so familiar with and they want to say, this is what I want changed. And this was what I want to change. And to just have that in our mind mm -hmm. to think now we need to help these people tell us what they want instead. If they don't want this, what do they want? It's a powerful thing. It can be used. I was picturing a meeting because I was recently in a meeting where um, that exact thing happened, yeah. where it was just like, we want him to stop hitting. And yeah. in this case, it was one of the staff members that just couldn't get off this. Well, if they'd only stop hitting, if they'd only stop hitting. And it took a practice just like that to say, well, let's turn the corner and look at what we would see. If he wasn't hitting, what would that look like? That's one way that I have them begin to picture it. And, and for the people that are listening, so for the families listening, what that would look like is when you see something, let's say, within your family that you're not happy with, that you're not happy with is, the first question, like you said, uh, instead of focusing on what you don't want, is what is it that I do want? And, and, and what then happens, and that is the most be beautiful thing about our powerful brain, you then start to uh, call up questions about that specific thing that you do want. So if you only focus on what you no longer want, your brain is only going to uh, well, contribute thoughts around that. Once your brain has heard sometimes for the first time, what it is that they do want or what it is that you do want and what that looks like, so, you know, get a detailed picture of what it is that you want. Your brain bec becomes so powerful and starts to ask questions that will help you to move from that one place to that new place. Yeah. Good. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I think that's important to remember, like you said, in the day-to-day -day life. You know, in the day-to-day -day life, it's a retraining of your mind. I mean, it might sound so simple when we're talking about it, and it sounds like, well, of course, all right, cool. I don't want this. I do want that. But it's it takes time to catch yourself and then say, oh, hold on now. I need to I need to ask myself that next question. It's that higher level focus that we need to have to really find the success, right? And it's a lovely exercise because I am positive that anyone listening that they will have that they won't have a problem mentioning what they no longer want in their life you know it's easy but when you then That's turn easy. it around what is it that you do want it is almost like a brain freeze so you got to be patient and give yourself time get a piece of paper create a mind map and just get put a pen on paper and start writing out okay what is it that i do want and once you come up with one yes. thing you either then ask so what will that look like or once you figured it out, you say, what else? So that you get a really detailed picture because the more detailed picture you get about where, where you want to go, the easier it is to travel there. So this, because it helps yeah. the mind have something to attach to, right? The mind attaches to that visual picture, that picture that you've created. And we know from our brain research that the mind doesn't know the difference between that that we did and the other one. But when we switch the focus, the mind, like you said, begins to work in its favor. I like what you said, contributes thoughts towards what we want it to. I like that. I'm going to yeah. steal that. You know, have your allow your mind to contribute thoughts towards the solutions. Absolutely, yeah. I love that. And, and that leads me to my second little bullet point that I've got here on my piece of paper, whereby, and this is my ultimate favorite out of everything that I ever teach because everyone does it. So it is about as, as a person, it, let's say within our family, but it's actually in whole life, we need to learn to move away from offering our own ideas and suggestions. And instead, we need to become an expert in knowing 
uh, what questions to ask to get, and this is the key point, particularly with children, uh, to get the other person uh, to come up with the solution. So we need to become an expert in knowing which questions can I ask to get the other person to come up with the solution. Because when someone really feels that they came up with the solution, they are way more likely to follow through with this. So take that back to a family. If you tell a child what to do, the child will often um, rebel uh, and will do the opposite. I mean, that's just a natural part. And the interesting thing is adults, we're, we're, we're a little bit older, but we have similar behavior. You know, when you tell your partner, I need you to go and do this, often there is some resistance. But if I come up with a question, I did it yesterday morning with my little one, and this is just a very simple um, example. But if I would say to my child, uh, come on, get dressed now, you know, it's time to go to school in 10 minutes, I, I would get like, ah, you know, for the people that are listening, my face has that, uh, that, that desperate feeling, I don't want to go, and, and you know, no motivation. Head, head back under the covers, yes, right? Exactly. But if I would ask him and I say, Sammy, you know, when do you think is a really good time this morning for you to get dressed? And he comes <laughs> up and he comes up with it. You know, I might give him a fist uh, pump, bump or a high five. And I say, that's brilliant. He owns it. So I think moving away from offering your ideas and suggestions, become an expert in knowing which questions can I ask? And, and to, to get the other person to come up with the solution so that they own it. Uh, and, and the key yeah. thing there, uh, Cher, is that, um, let me think, I've lost my train of thought for a little bit, but. Um, well, I was already, I was thinking, while you think about yeah. that, I was thinking about how I actually did that exact same thing with my daughter. Mm -hmm. She had told me the day before, hey, I like getting to school at a certain time. Yeah. Well, you know, in order to get there at that time, you have to wake up at a certain time, right? Yeah. So I'm like, well, what time do you think you would need to wake up yeah. in order to make that happen? Yeah. You know, and then she, the, the next few days, she was popping up because subconsciously her mind made the switch you just talked about. I didn't really put the correlation together, but it's what you meant. She needed to then allow her mind to go yeah. from, hey, mom, I like getting to school at this time because yeah. my friends wait for me and we have time to you know, chat before class starts yeah. to, oh, what do I have to get to, to, what do I have to do to get there? And then the ownership yeah. happened. Yeah. I suddenly thought about what I wanted to, sh to say. And that was, you know, sometimes people say to me, Eric, but can I not have any ideas or suggestions? I've got such good ideas. And, and, <laughs> right. and, and I said, it's absolutely fine to have your good ideas. I mean, they are in your brain, but instead of them, what we naturally normally do is because we, we are problem solvers, instead of then go and tell that good idea, you simply ask yourself, what question can I come up with to get them to think about that? Um, yeah. I, I have seen so many shifts by simply people removing this element from telling people what to do towards giving them the ownership so that they own it. And I, it's, it's, Parents or families would say to me, man, it's, it's like a, a little light bulb moment or it, what I would call it is an increased awareness of, of mm -hmm. themselves. And, and I've seen that's kind of what, what when I train people, the whole concept is about helping families to have an increased awareness because our brain sometimes is uh, so, uh, how do you call that, set in a certain way, set in a certain pattern. And, and when you come up with a new idea like this and, and they start to implement it and they get results straight away, you know, the arguing is less. Uh, and, and this is not just from a family with children, with children. This is just in relationships, you know, give people ownership, make them feel that it, it belongs to them. And you will see a massive change in the, uh, in, in the result that you actually want. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that happens so fast in our brain. Like our brain automatically thinks of three or four different ways that they might be able to solve their problem. Yeah. And if a parent's not careful, off they go with their, and they don't realize their child is glazed over. Their child stopped really paying attention to those tips like, mm -hmm. you know, six, seven minutes ago, because they're like, oh, here we go again. My parents got all the answers. 
Well, then what happened? Their brain went into automatic pilot right there. Yeah. And uh, there's only a few ways we can shake that. And one, like you said, is to reframe what you're, it, it takes a little more thinking. It takes a little more planning, mm -hmm. but the results are amazing, right? Yeah. When we can actually have our children take ownership of it. I've had the same exact thing happen as you, where the, the parents or families or even teachers, mm -hmm. they get mixed up to think that we're putting the child in control. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know how to explain this and you probably could explain it better, but they, they get mixed up into thinking that it's like we're diminishing their control and giving the child this unwritten, like, no, I'm the parent, you know, they're not equal to me type thing. And I don't know if you could take a minute to speak on how that's not what we're talking about in the solution focused no. approach. I, I have had the feedback whereby people said, uh, are you, uh, yeah, giving giving them too much control? But the whole the whole concept, and this is the beautiful thing. Uh, I find this the beautiful thing because uh, everyone wants to be treated with respect. So when you tell someone what to do, they will feel a level of I don't want to say disrespect, but there's something happening there that puts the what's the expression. Uh, puts them in a place of uh, that they feel they need to watch out or they need to be alert or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think it's a respectful way, but also there is no way that the child controls the situation. It's actually the opposite. Be, by by giving the child rather than uh, you know tell the child what to do and and then the child has to control. I'm not doing that. I'm not getting dressed and all of that. That is actually giving the child control. And then you spend a lot of time on battling that and you feel horrible and the child goes to school, let's say horrible. What you're actually doing, you control. And some people might feel, are you not manipulating them? But I think we are educating them. We, I'm, I'm leading by example uh, because I think we all should treat each other in that way that um, if I can give the ownership to the child, but the, the child only gets to that place via me coaching the child with my question. So it might look on the outset, we're giving the child control, but basically us as the, the, the parent or the family member, we control the situation with our questions. But for the child, they perceive it that they actually, hey, I came up with this, I own this. And therefore, again, yes. way more likely to follow through with it. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, Good. yeah. And it also helps us to be in a frame of mind of being understanding our children mm -hmm. because if we take a step back from that in order to reframe a question mm -hmm. that's going to work for our child yeah. we need to listen carefully to where they're at yeah. and have enough respect to honor where they're at and be what we call being in their world view yeah. you know and that alone is is a, a skill of a parent I feel as though when they're able to have empathic listening and they're really able to listen to where their child is at and then craft some questions mm. to help them move to a higher mm. level, mm. Um, they're really increasing their entire repertoire of abilities, yeah. like your entire abilities yeah. in work, yeah. in relations with people, it, it's leveled up when okay. they practice those things you're talking yeah. about. And, and you know, as the, there is no book that if you read all these chapters, uh, you're a brilliant parent. You know, parent is something we, we often parent the way we have experienced being parent. And and what I love doing when I uh, connect with families is like, again, it's like, um, how do you call that? It's kind of breaking that pattern of thinking and introducing some new way of thinking. And, and, and I always say, you know, I'm not telling you to, to be a different parent, you know, explore what it is that you're doing well. And you can see that by the results that you get, but be open to introduce new things. And that's the fun part of, of being a parent is that there is never a time that we cannot learn. There's always time that we can grow, you know, within ourselves. And, and I, I make it a big thing in our lives, both my wife and myself, we are fascinated by why do we do the things that we do? What drives us? And, and I'm fascinating by asking questions because, you know, our brain, when you ask Google a question, Google will never comes back to you and say, I don't know, you know? So 
we the, our brain is like that so if we ask good powerful questions to our brain about our situation that we're dealing with within our family you'll get a powerful good quality answer ask poor questions and you will get you know poor answers that are not so helpful therefore it is good to learn about what kind of questions should i be asking you know and, and, yeah. and i want to introduce yeah the, the next bit which is a little bit linking yes to let's this. do it and i want to talk about you know there's a specific word and i think you're going to guess which word it is that is connected when you see people including myself uh who keep doing the same thing over and over again but are hoping for a different outcome what is the word that i'm looking for that's the the definition of what ins insanity yeah yeah it's insanity <laughs> and, and and again it is because we are so locked up in a pattern of behavior or in a pattern of how we deal with things and you see it in the shopping centers when families are dealing with children and stressful situations yes. or you see it when couples are in an argument it's always the same yes. pattern it's the same thing but they are expecting a different outcome so what what we you know, need to do is and so if something works do more of it but if it doesn't work and this is the key thing if it doesn't work if you as a parent or a family realize that this is not working you got to force yourself to chuck it in the bin and leave it there mm -hmm. and then ask yourself okay i need to come up with a new strategy you've got to learn to accept that something is not working and and i call it what well, i have kind of created a pause button on my chest right here i have a pause button and i can press that pause button and that pause button gives me a few seconds the time to ask a few more powerful questions so if something is not working, um, if people go to YouTube share yeah, and they go and look for Mohammed Ali when he is dancing around his opponent, he, you, he's got these long legs and long arms and he dances with his opponent in the middle. He dances around and he tries to find his way in. And if one strategy doesn't work, does he give up? No, he goes to the next one. And if that doesn't work, he goes to the next one until he finds his way in. And that is what we do as human beings. We cannot give up. So we just accept it's not working. That's perfectly fine. I move it in the bin. I leave it there. And I have to ask my brain, okay, let's come up with a new strategy to tackle something. And, you know, regarding, for example, autism that I mentioned before, it's a very complex world. Each child is such an individual child. Autism or no autism, by the way. Each child is their own individual character. So we got to come up with individual strategies. If you have three children, you can't treat child number three with the same strategies and techniques as child number one. They are different people. So if, but it is important if something is already working, simply do more of it. That's a very much a solution focused um, principle, but realize when it's not work, don't get into the insanity state of mind, like I need to do it again and again and expect this, a different outcome. Think of a new strategy. Do you recognize any of that? Oh, absolutely. And it's almost like it, it free yourself of the burden yeah. of trying to continue with the same thing and banging your head against the wall, right? Yeah. It's a freedom, really, because when you step back and go, wait a minute, it's not working you know and you really stop because that's kind of what i find happens with my the clients that i work with is i'll ask a, a question i ask all, all the time is all the time and almost every interaction is is that working for you yeah. and no of course it's not working blah 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 okay so let's talk about what might work it's it really just it never dawns on them that they're they're in a uh, in a pattern yeah. you know of just trying the same thing over and over and over again. And like you said, I knew it. We all know the saying, oh, what's the definition of anxiety? Use the same thing. But our brain is so wired yeah. to do what we've seen in the past yeah. that this takes a deliberate 
stand, right? It takes a deliberate stand for us to say, I am going to try something different and tell yourself that in the mirror. You're trying something different today. (laughs) You know, I'm I'm still in the midst of that process, trying to find the right strategy to to find a way that works for me to lose weight. But I'm not not giving up, you know, (laughs) but I've tried many times. The same strategy, hoping to get a different outcome. You know, we're all in that. And it's really, you know, how much can we wake up our brain and and get our brain brain to realize that that pattern and how can we break it? And it's exciting what's on the other side. You know, once you you get there and and you try different things, it's just, there's a, a, how do you call it, a, a peaceful thing about it. Because no one expects that you get it the first time or the second time or even the third time. But I do believe that when you're consistent in your new strategies, you, you'll get there at some point. And, uh, and that- well, I wonder about um, you're saying uh, we're, we're kind of talking about the questions. I'm getting kind of stuck at that because a few weeks back we we talked in my podcast about impact impact in. Uh, listening, <laughs> impactive listening. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying the word right. I said it earlier this morning. Um, when we're really, truly listening, mm-hmm. how do we stop ourselves from thinking about the, you know, forming a question in our mind? You know, because, and I don't know if you've come, you know, where it's like here you are in the moment and you want to be in that moment with them. And then your mind is formulating a powerful question. Yeah. How can we help our families with quieting our mind enough to listen yeah. and then being ready to ask a question that time in between when it's almost like we're having to pause mid conversation. That is an, I don't it, know. That, How have you that is an interesting that? one because in the heat of the moment, uh, I always use an example when, when me and my wife are, let's say at that place whereby we are in a heated discussion, I can, I catch my brain sometimes going while she is talking listening uh, you know my brain goes okay what is the next thing that i could say that will actually make me yeah. this conversation but the ultimate <laughs> thing yeah the ultimate thing is what do i want the outcome to to be what is the true outcome mm-hmm. that are you so that's you start with the end in mind when you start with the end in mind you already change your position uh so and, and it's also about Getting to, well, okay, when does someone uh, becomes, uh, when do you get the most influence over someone? And I'm not talking influence in a negative way, but so the, the key thing, and we all know this already, it's again one of those moments whereby your brain might think, yeah, it's logic, but I haven't thought about it, is that, and you mentioned it already, it's about the listening. If someone feels truly listened to, then that is the moment when they are ready to listen to you so Mm -hmm. from experience i know that i get much quicker to my outcome what i what what i think is the best for us as a family by in-depth listening and and how i do that is that before i even go and ask a question i will drip feedback what the other person actually said to me and that will make the other person feel listened to and you know when someone feels listened to the fiery bit of that conversation comes down already and then i i think yeah. the key aspect here is is can we be grown up enough to actually lay aside what i want out of this moment you know can i be grown up enough to say what is overall the best outcome for us as a family and and take position from that place it sounds like that in order to quiet the mind from thinking about the next thing that they want to say and thinking, well, what's my powerful question that I'm going to come up with? Rather than that, when we're doing that pause you talked about, we need to say, keep your eye on the outcome. The outcome is that we cooperate. Or the outcome is that my child is able to, you know, um, understand this concept or whatever the outcome is. I like that idea of that because our mind, you know, it's, it's thinking a thousand miles an hour during our conversations yeah. with our family yeah. and we need to attach to something that's going to be helpful yeah. because if not, this entire process is going to be derailed by our automatic thinking. Yeah. And before you know it, we're busy sharing our opinion. They're busy saying why they're not going to do it. And we're like, Oh, okay. We're back where we started. So I like that we've kind of 
together kind of like process this to where the, if the mind automatically says, remember your outcome, yeah, then it's not going to be saying, am I going to win or not? Exactly. What am I going to say next? Exactly. You know, it, and then the next point is the powerful questions have to kind of be something we practice beforehand then, right? So it's kind of like we well, automatically can. And, and that's why I think you need to be graceful with yourself because you're going to mess up. You know, we are so naturally built to respond and to react. We are re often reactionary people. Uh, and and yes. so this can only happen over time. Um, I, I often compare it to uh, someone who plays table tennis. Uh, it, I don't know, is that how you call it in, in the US? Table tennis? Uh, table pong, tennis ping or, pong? yeah, or, or yes, yeah, okay. ping pong. So exactly. when someone plays that for the very first time, and hold the bat in their hands, they will feel awkward when the ball comes at them. It's it's really like, but someone who has practiced it and done it quite a few times, the other person can hit a ball or a horrible situation, if you would relate it to that, at you. And because your body, your brain and your muscles are trained to react to it, it is, you see those people, the ball comes at them with a speed and within a flash, they hit the ball back. And that is what I've noticed in this process. If I'm not trained, if I haven't practiced this and my muscles are not used to this, then yeah, I might get fiery back. I might you know, lose the concept, but by doing it, practicing it, you become like a tennis player who knows exactly when and how to respond back. So it's a matter of allowing yourself to practice, be graceful when it doesn't work. Uh, but yeah, at all times, Start with the end in mind. When you know what it is that you want, it is so much easier to get there. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I have one last one. I know. Ugh. Is that all right? That's what I was just going to ask you. I was just going to, that's exactly where we were going. You were reading my mind. I was like, I, I'm curious. What's the last point that you put on there? Well, the la last one is kind of a combination of many things. You know, sometimes we need to take in consideration the state that the other family member is in. You know, when you're in a state of being anxious, worried, frustrated, angry, uh, or hangry, like hungry and, and stuff like that. So when they're in that state, that often is not a good starting point to, to achieve something. So in the solution focus approach, as you know, we have step one, which is all about how do we connect with people? And we call that problem free talking. So. And I remember once I was with a family and this child was 11 years old, 12 years old maybe, and she was having the biggest, what do you call that, tantrum uh, on the settee. She was lying on the settee. Temper tantrum. Yeah, that's the one. And she was lying uh, on the settee, throwing all sorts of things at us. And as I was talking to the mother, I was indirect without, without her realizing, I was indirect talking to her. But she, she so she was sure. picking up things. But then she threw herself on the floor like a big crash and got her phone out and started flicking through her phone. And from the corner of my eye, I noticed they were all pictures of her dog. So I mirrored her behavior and I threw myself on the floor and, ah. and I became <laughs> super interested in her dog. And yes. within five minutes, she was a total different child because we had something that we connected over and, 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 and that made a massive shift. So sometimes before you actually want to tackle something with someone, ask yourself, have I, have I got the right connection with that, with my child or with my partner, whoever I'm trying to do, because from a place of anger, frustration, uh, anxiousness, people freeze, you will not get them to move. And then I was thinking, I wanted to add something there that is not so much solution focused principle, but man, it is so important. And it's called relationship first. You know, as a parent, sometimes, or as a top parent, but as a family member, sometimes we try to gain leverage over a situation by cutting ourselves off, by saying, I'm not talking to you anymore. Uh, and, and you walk out of the room and you disconnect. And I understand why people do that because you might be really irritated. However, by doing that, you instantly lose any opportunity to still influence the other person by cutting yourself off. 
So the relationship first pr process or, or model uh, or concept is all about asking yourself that one question. If I am going to react like this, let's say if you picture a child, for example, something happens or a partner, but if I am going to, something happens that irritates you, if I am going to react like this, will I still have a connection or am I still in relationship with this person? Because I want, that, that is the most important aspect of what I'm trying to achieve. I still need to stay in connection with that person because that is where I keep a chance to influence them. If I cut myself off and I'm positive that everyone listening will have a memory when they try to use the cutting of the walking out of the room, I'm no longer talking to you as a way to gain leverage over the situation. And often that leaves you feeling horrible, miserable. You don't want that really. There is this bit where we don't speak to each other. So do relationship first. If I'm going to react like this, will I still have relationship with this person? If not, then change how you're going to react so that you continue to yeah. stay in relationship. So that's the, the, the uh, double whammy of the, the problem free talking, the connection towards the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that sometimes things get so heated that we need a minute. You know, we need some space. They need some space. You need some space. Yeah. And there's ways that we can get that space without the, I'm not talking to you type thing. But it's hard. I know that. It's um, hard, isn't it, Sharon? It's very hard. Uh, yeah, it's very hard. We... I'm just thinking of all the moments. Yeah, yeah. the moments that happen. And then I, in no way I know neither you or I are wanting anyone to ever beat themselves up about this exactly. because yeah. that, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's a process, but the yeah. more we listen to this podcast, I mean, sometimes you have to listen to it again and again mm. and get it in your mind mm. and then say, okay, how can I shift that? How can I change that? And even when we need a minute, we can say, you know what, let's give ourselves both a minute and come back and visit this because it means a lot to yeah. me. You know, it means a lot to me that I understand you and I need a minute. That is there's so much, there's a lot of respectful ways that we can give ourselves space and then invite the conversation to come back when the time is right, right? Absolutely. And you know, I can't exactly remember what your first initial question was, but I think what difference did it make to to you? I mean, you started- Yeah, I mean, all of these points we want to revisit, but I am interested. I mean, what difference has it truly made for you? And well, what I love is that the old Eric who was not using these principles, he came in as someone who within the first 10 minutes offered the other person every idea under the sun that he had tried with other people and, and they worked with other people or something like that. What I felt a real, there's, there's, well, I always use this sentence, there is logic to it all. You know, you might be confronted with any kind of situation. There is, if you look at the things that we talked about in this interview, and you're trying to implement those few little things in your life, I am 100% convinced that you will see a shift in your family relationships, in, in your happiness level. Uh, also, I don't know, the, the fact that you feel empowered, you know, those few principles, these few things that we discussed, those are like tools in your toolbox. They will equip you to, you know, no longer by force, uh, but all about coaching someone, guiding someone, you know, from the situation that you no longer want to the situation that you do want. And so, yeah, yeah. I'm really curious. I would love to hear anyone that picked one of these things and, and, and tried it out. Like, you know, in our pre-chat, uh, you said you used something from the past interview that I did uh, in episode 32, 30, oh, in the 30s. 32, yeah, 32. You, you started using those little things in in your work and stuff and, and it is when there is logic to it it's so great to see that and that was the best thing me as a worker i didn't have to come back to this family because it, it makes sense and when it makes yes. sense they can do it again you know like i said if something works do more of it and so yes that is it for me as a worker i went from the place man i need to solve this i need to do this to no all i need to learn is what powerful questions can I ask to get the other person to take ownership? And with ownership yes. comes freedom, comes feeling good about yourself, and comes better outcomes for your family. Yeah. If the outcome that we want is that our 
child is taking ownership of their own actions, mm. then then the action that we take towards them will be in line with that. Right. So if we say, oh, remember, I don't want to take ownership of this. I want them to take ownership of this. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be tempted to take it back. You know, oh, no, I'm going to just show them how to make their bed. It's much quicker that way anyway. Yeah. You know, just forget mm -hmm. it. And then then we have to remind us, wait a minute. I would like them to be the one that makes their own bed. Let me move towards that. It's, it's in the little tiny things. And then we're going to see a difference. So I think that's what I really am going to challenge us to do this week, whether we're teachers working with kids, whether we have, you know, the whatever children that you have in your life or even just your relationships, begin to take listen back and, and implement these steps that Eric has said. But more than that, be ultra aware of what you're actually after. What is the outcome that your preferred future that you would like to see? And then take steps towards that internally it will change everything and you'll want to look for questions you'll want to ask questions because you'll want to be able to unlock their full potential yeah true <laughs> i i'm inspired myself i know that you and i both know that the junior high years are fun years to work through and it's conversations like this that not only um help me to be able to help the clients i work with yeah. But as we know, it inspires us to be the best people in our own life as well. So thank you so much, Eric. It's great. It's great to be able to get refreshed with this conversation. Yeah, you're very welcome. You know, and as I'm listening to you, I just want to make one tiny thing really clear. I struggle with all of these things still every day. And that is part of life. I just hope that every day I get a tiny bit better at it. Yeah. Uh, and that's the exciting part, uh, you know, when it gets better, you see better, better outcomes and you enjoy your relationships a lot more. Yeah. And I know that you have made a lot, a, a big difference in a lot of professionals lives that are, have the same heart that we do to really just help people. And I wonder if you could just let us know where we could find you. So people that are listening right now, if they want to work with you, where's the best place for us to find you? All right. Well, the best place. Did we even say where you live? I think we just skipped. We just assumed everyone knows everything about I you. I am from the UK. <laughs> I'm originally born in the Netherlands, as you can probably hear from my accent. But uh, I'm based in the UK. Um, and uh, But you can find me at uh, solutionfocus.co.uk. Um, I normally work with uh, professionals who help families. However, I am very open, anyone listening to this and anyone that is that has got like a really burning question, you can send an email uh, and the email address, it's, it's a weird one, but it's solution focused HQ. Uh, that's the only one that was available at, uh, at gmail.com. So uh, it will be in the show notes. Uh, but send, send yes, I'll question. put it in the show I'm notes. I'm very much uh, willing to hear your question and send you a uh, some thoughts back and uh, let's connect. And the great thing is, is even though you're over in the UK, um, you're, you're, you're helping people in the United States to also gather this, gather this information and utilize it Absolutely. in their schools, in their professional life, in their families. And, um, it's making, it's already made such a big difference with so many of my listeners and the people that today I know are going to walk away and remember yeah. the words that you're saying. Um, to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm not just going to influence my country. Let's let's take this around the world. Um, at a conference that we're ha we're doing together, coming up here at the end of October, we're going to have solution focused experts from all over the world. Yeah. Um, not only some others from the UK, from the United States, from my state of California, from Texas, where Lit Dr. Linda Medcalf is from, as well as even Japan, and. It shows that these concepts, these solution focused concepts, they work, they work everywhere. Yeah. It's, it, it breaks the barrier of, uh, of where we live in our culture to say, how do humans relate? And if any of you are educators and you want to look, find us at the end of October here, coming up here super soon, it's the solution focused schools, unlimited conference. Just look up school solution focused schools, unlimited with Dr. Linda Medcalf. And we'd love to see you there. There will be uh, all the links in the show notes. But I think beyond all of that, whether you find me at my website, 
whether you hop on over to Eric's website, really our heart is that you're able to bring your best self into the situations in your family Mm. so you can make a difference. And we both really believe that the solution focused approach is the way to do that. So thank you for helping me uh, continue to spread this message, Eric, to the people that listen. Thank you for having me. Uh, It was my pleasure. And I, yeah, I, I feel the fire burning in my heart after this little conversation that we had. So I'm looking forward to the conference and, and to hear from you listeners. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. And in the future, we are going to have your wife on because yeah. she's written a book and all the work that she's done with autism, mm-hmm. not only her research, but where you're at. I know that it is an ongoing thing. Your child that's 19 is might as well be seven. You need to continuously parent. And so, um, I'm very much looking forward to that future conversation. If you guys are listening in the future, look for these episodes because it's going to help you in your life. Um, If you're dealing with a family that has autism uh, in in their family and you just don't quite understand it, uh, reach out. Reach out to Eric and you'll be able to hear from her as well. Sally, right? Yeah. Can I'm I looking just forward give, to that conversation. Can I just give a shameless plug here? Uh, you know, because... Do it. If, and yes, if there please. is a family out there where your child is diagnosed with autism and you're wondering where should I go? What should I do? This is totally new to me. If you go to Amazon and you type in Miracle in Slow Motion... Uh, and it's a subtitle that says from autism diagnosis to an exciting future, something like that, but miracle in slow motion. It's the story of our son from diagnosis all the way up to age 11. And it's not just a story, it's everything that we have figured out that worked uh, and how we refined it, but also everything that didn't work because you need to share both. I can promise you, if you just read the uh, the, the testimonials or the, the, the star uh, reviews, you will see if it will speak to you or not. But that is a really good place to start. And I, I'm looking forward for her to come and talk to you because I mean, she is on fire when it comes down to that topic. And so much more is possible. So much more is possible. Uh, but yeah. Enough about that miracle. Then what some of the professionals, in slow we don't, we're not all about putting ourselves in a box, right? Yeah. If so many people want to say like, this is how it's supposed to work and you know, did it, but we, we break free of that and say what's possible. And that's what you guys have done. Um, not only with your parenting, but with your practice. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. Everyone yeah. go over and get that book. And, uh, and I'm going to put the name of that in the show notes as well. So, we're going to get going on our day. You getting about your night. <laughs> we, it's, let me tell you guys, we, it, it took a little bit of time for us to make sure that we could correlate our schedules with us, uh, me over here in California and you over there in the UK. But every time we do, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us.